right, everybody, how are we doing? It is a crazy time in golf, and I love it. That like We're really kicking off the 2022 season, and we're, we're diving in. I mean, we just had the uh, Waste Management Phoenix Open, and craziness ensues out there, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about... Uh, who's there, there, there's been a lot of talk of like, who's the best golf YouTuber. So I figured, Hey, I, I'll jump into the mix a little bit and talk a little bit about that and give my, my two cents for what it's worth. And, uh, and I, I want to also give you, you know, I've done a lot of these private club tours and the people have been asking me like, what's the best one you've been to. So I'll rank those for you with what I've done and we've got some good things coming up. So that's going to be exciting. Also, we're going to talk a little bit about some wedges because Titleist has released some new wedges and I want to get into a little bit of that and show you the differences between the iterations over the last few years. So you kind of have a good idea of what you're getting yourself into when it comes to the new SM9 wedges or really any wedges for that matter. It gets a little, uh, you can go deep like in the forest, in the weeds, in the rabbit trails of wedges, and you may never come out. But uh, I'm gonna simplify it a little bit for you so that we can uh, make a, have a little more kind of clarity of what's going on, because we can make it very difficult or we can make it very simple. I'm gonna try to make it simple, all right? So first things first, let us dig into the waste management, because, you know, that's, something that I think is very awesome. I mean, the event was cool, and but there's a lot of stuff that happened there. Now, all right, let's 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 first deal with Seath, you know, Thagala. Like, first of all, I've followed this guy for a long time. I've known who he was through the junior golf world in Southern California, and I mean, that's where I'm from. So I've seen him around a long time, and he went to Pepperdine, and phenomenal standout player on the uh, Pepperdine golf team. And so, you know, I've seen him playing in events at uh, North Ranch. They have a tournament out there, and that's kind of the Pepperdine home track anyways. So I'm super familiar with this guy. I've known for years he was going to be uh, he's going to be on the scene. So that w that's cool. I was happy for the guy. I'm super pulling for him, rooting for that dude all day, all week. And, you know, he just – bad break, whatever it was, but he hung tough. It wasn't like he went and laid an egg on Sunday. I mean, the guy was there the whole day, up and down. I mean, it's a grind. It's hard to win out there. And Scotty Scheffler, also a dude who's been around a long time and always, you know, he, his first win. So hats off to him and to beat Cantlay in the final, uh, in the playoff, phenomenal. So good stuff. I mean, hats off to everybody it made it the tournament. One of the most exciting of the year so far, I felt like Pebble Beach was kind of a letdown. Jordan made it exciting because he got in the mix. But overall, uh, you know, no offense to the winners of any event. I mean, it's, it's hard to win out there and you guys work your tail off. So kudos to you. I I'm a huge fan of the sport. Regardless, I do like it to be a little more exciting. And the waste management is the tournament where we get that initial jolt of excitement. There were some things that happened with uh, starting off, let's say Sam Ryder's hole in one on the 16th hole. Obviously you're familiar with the 16th hole. It's just gotten crazier and crazier over the years. And I've loved what they've done with it. The full on, uh, enclosure or grandstand stadium feel of that one hole, I think is phenomenal. And personally, I think there should be something like that. I, I'm not going to say every week on the tour. I don't. I don't think that should be the case. I, I think it's unique to that one particular event, which is awesome. But you know what I do think is that there should be something like that. Like they have Top Golf where you just hit, have food, drinks, have a good time, and you're hitting and playing games out there on target land. Awesome. But how cool would it be if, let's say, in Vegas or somewhere like that where 
you're having dinner and drinks and having a great time in a like par three or par something hole and golfers are coming through there and playing and they could be whoever and you maybe have a chance to throw a couple bucks down on them or bet on them gamble on whatever i think it could be a cool uh, vegas thing that they could put together all based on you know the concept or what's happened there with the 16th hole there at the tpc so uh, scottsdale so with that in mind i mean it's pretty awesome and i think there's a lot we could do with that concept where you could go somewhere and have a cool experience. I mean, they have those restaurants where you're like knights of the round table or whatever, and people are jousting. Well, in the same way, you would do that with golf where you go have dinner and people play a hole. And at the end of the night, there's a, a champion that you're rooting for. And it's kind of like a gladiator coliseum type of feel. There's something that can be done. Now, you're not gonna get PGA players there because that opens up that whole can of worms of the PGA Tour, <clears throat> the, the the mafia monopoly PGA Tour will not allow their people, their players, their uh, need. I mean, they own these guys for for all intents and purposes. They're not going to allow them to go do these other types of events like the match. You heard Phil say he had to pay something like a million bucks in order to be able to play in the match, which, hey, you know, there's two sides of this argument where the PGA Tour has created a place for these people to play and make tons of money. Fantastic, right? So of course, if you did that, you would own every piece and aspect to it, such as all the players, you would own them, you would own all the media rights, you, you make sure you own everything. Uh, of course, I would too, if that was my business model. It's smart, and they do it all the way. And for example, like Phil Mickelson cannot own hit the, the visual rights, the video of him making that putt to win his first major at Augusta and jumping up and down. He can't own that. He can't license that footage. The PGA Tour owns that. What he can do is make a logo of him jumping and trademark that. He can own the logo, but he cannot then sell or make any money off the actual visual of him jumping, right? So the tour owns that, and they license that over and over and over, and they make tons and tons of money off of that. And he's talked about that, and I could see the frustration there, but hey, Phil, like I, I would say, if you want to own that, then go create a tour, go bring your camera crew in and collect a bunch of other professionals to play on your tour. And then you could own the rights to yourself as the PGA tour has done. I can see their side of the argument and thus they don't like the Saudi tour coming in and doing anything or taking any of the players. What would I do? You know, Hey, if I'm 45 or 50 or whatever, I'd say, Forget it, I'm going to the Saudi tour. That's what I would do if I was an older player. And some of the younger players like Bryson are considering it. And I would too. You know who I would love to see on the tour are other guys that were awesome on the PGA tour that we haven't seen ever, like uh, Anthony Kim. I would love to see him on the Saudi tour. And the Saudi, you know, there's all the rumors about his injury and his insurance and blah, 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 blah where he, if he were to play professionally, he would lose his insurance money. Okay, well, the Saudis, that Saudi tour, they have the cash to give him to cover that which would, he would lose. So just, hey, dude, I just pay the guy out and say, dude, come play with us and have a good time. And I would get guys like him in there. I would get Ricky Fowler because Ricky is a huge draw and he's not doing so hot on the PGA Tour. So you could grind it out on the tour and try to make it, or you could come play, collect a lot of uh, sponsorship money and a lot of other money and play on the Saudi Tour. And I would just throw it out there. Like if I'm the Saudi Tour, I'm throwing Ricky an offer 
he can't refuse or if he were to refuse it now like it's it's a one time off take it or leave it like i would play hardball with that guy because he'd be a big draw and he's not doing so hot on the tour it's like one of those things like hey ricky do you really want to struggle on the tour and potentially lose your card and be kicked to the corn ferry tour or do you want to come play with us permanently you're in forever don't worry about a thing here's all this money i would throw that offer today and i say but if you turn down our offer it ain't coming back like that's scary so that i mean i could see people are playing hardball both ways pga tour are saying if you touch that you're not you're not playing over here ever again so i could see it but I, it's exciting because I am curious to see how this will land. All right, but back to a little bit of the waste management. What do we think of the beer throwing and all that stuff with the hole in one? Personally, I loved it. I think it was spur of the moment at that time and whatever. Ye, these guys know that the tournament officials know stuff's gonna happen there and they gotta prepare for it. So have your cleaning crew there ready to rock and roll. If that gets thrown out, clear it out. Look, those beers are like $10, $12 beers. So they're going to throw those out and then they're going to go get some more. So it's good money maker for guys hitting great shots for <laughs> the concession stands. So throw away. I'm, I'm just getting volunteers in there. Come on out and pick it up quicker, faster. We're prepared. We're ready next year. You're not even going to know that uh, a beer was thrown like 30 seconds afterward because it's gonna be picked up so fast. That's what I would do. And hey, financially, I'd encourage it because it's just the way it is and you're gonna make more money. But just hopefully nobody gets clocked in the head with a beer can, so watch out. That's what I have these guys wearing helmets picking that stuff up as fast as they can drop it down there. I loved it. What, you know, they, look, these people are camping out early a.m., 2, 3, 4 a.m., waiting for the gates to open so they can run in and get their spot on 16. So, they're, dude, they're drinking all day long. They're partying hardcore. So I would say, like, you know it's coming. It's to be expected. So don't freak out when weird stuff happens when you set up an environment for weirdness, right? You know that's gonna happen. You set it up, people do weird stuff. It's your own dang fault. So roll with it. I think they like it secretly. They might not say it, I don't know, but I liked it. What I didn't like, I'll tell you, so, okay. So then Justin Thomas chips in and they kind of do the same thing, not to the level of the hole in one by Ryder and Ortiz, but they did kind of go there for a chip in. Now, Justin, he kind of egged it on like he's raising his arms there right after he chips in and doing his thing. And then they start throwing beer and you could tell he was like, oh, no, 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 stop, stop. I, I didn't want you to do that. Well, too bad. Uh, they're going to do it because they're drunk and they're having a good time. So any good shot, they're just looking for an excuse to party, right? A bunch of young people partying away all day. And for the most part, it's kind of boring because not a whole lot's happening. So anything by anybody is going to warrant an awesome freak out session, right? I would probably, if I was in that crowd drinking away like these guys, I would probably just have a do whatever you're doing. Like for the most part, I would have done what they did. Throw, yeah, throw your beer. I might have finished it first and then thrown the empty bottle because I'm, you know, I'm a penny pincher. A little bit so i don't know what they're gonna do in the future but i did like that and i would just prepare for it even better i would have the concessions ready to rock and roll like dude ha like let get people moving here faster if they do that so we can make more money and let's get a cleanup crew in there quicker faster better each and every time so i would just prepare way way better what i did not like was uh, Harry Higgs and Joel Damon taking their shirts off. Now that that was, 
look, Harry Higgs is one of those like party animal kind of dudes. He's kind of fun loving. I love the guy. Same with Joel. I love those guys. I love watching them. I think they're fun to watch. They're uh, exciting. I like the way they, you know, engage with the media and the fans. Phenomenal. Ripping your shirts off, though, for anybody, I think is I think that's crossing the line, not, not necessarily because of the way you look, but because of the just the propriety of the sport, Me meaning it, there, there's a class to it. Like there's a respect level. There's that. That's just where I come from with it. Like the fans could do whatever they want. The, the look, the girl could rip off her clothes and chase Tiger Woods at the open championship. All right. Or whoever should change, right? Like stuff like that can happen. Fans could do it. Fans could run and streak and cool, right? You see that at football games, but you never see like a football player ripping his clothes off and streaking, they, right? They just don't do that. So I don't think a player, a tour player that it should rip off their shirt and do that kind of stuff. It's the equivalent of being the streaker on the field. And the player is never the one doing that. Soccer players, they, they do it. That's kind of where it's allowed. It's part of their celebration. Golfers have, I don't think they've ever really done that. Even when they win a tournament, they jump in the lake, basically fully clothed for the most part. Like you didn't win, you didn't make a hole in one. You didn't do anything really spectacular on the whole. There's no reason to rip your shirt off other than just to get some crowds going crazy again. So that I didn't like. If I were the tour, I would step in and say, uh-uh, like I'd find you personally. I, I would say that's, and I would let every player know like that does not happen. No way, no. So I think they'll probably step in and say something about that. Uh, in my opinion, we're not going to hear about it, but I'm pretty sure that they've already uh, handled that situation, if you know what I'm saying. So, and I, no, I didn't like it, if you're asking me. I think that was just, just, you know, below the belt. That's like going going blue in comedy, they say, like using language and jokes just to get a laugh when you don't need to. And so I feel like they went blue in that regard by ripping their shirts off. And then, you know, forget about, but maybe some people won't, like you hear the crowd and they didn't really show it, but you heard it on other holes where the crowd was screaming. And I don't know if it was to them or somebody else, but you hear the crowd saying, take it off, take it off, take chanting this. and. Obviously, at an LPGA event, that would not be appropriate. People would get just like, it would be uh, huge, huge news. Like, you would never do such a horrid thing. So I don't see why at a PGA event you would be uh, celebrated for doing that and even partake in doing that because, you know, on the other side of the coin, like, it wouldn't be acceptable at all. So... That's where I am like, ah, I draw the line there. But like at an LPGA event, sure, there would be beers thrown and stuff like that would happen. Fans can do and should do, you know, on occasion, wild and crazy things. Because you expect that from people who have been drinking all day. A dude who's been playing golf for 15 holes and shows up to 16 and rips his shirt off. Nah, come on. I mean, let's like, let's grow up a little bit here. This is not what it's supposed to be. I don't care where you are. Like, it's just, let's not do that. Sorry. That's my opinion. What's yours? Comment in this uh, video and let me know. Let me know what you would think, what you would do. What would you want to be done there? Either way, with the beers, with the cheers, with the skin. <laughs> I don't know, but that the skin is where I draw the line for me. You, you, you let me know what you think. All right, here's what I wanna do. I wanna dive into some equipment stuff because I've had the Vokey SM9s sitting around for a while and I have a, a custom set fully fitted coming in that I'm looking forward to testing. But there's a lot of like 
like, what is this? It's just a new wedge. And look, here's the nine. Um, here's the um, eight. This is my SM8 custom for me. And then here's like an off the rack SM7. So I have a seven, eight, and nine. Like, what's the difference? Like, what are we doing here? And why would we upgrade for a wedge? And like, it is important because there's a lot of technology that kind of happens and then, but where do we even begin? Let me just go over the technology here a little bit about the different iterations of seven, eight, and nine. So initially, all right, so here's your seven. It's kind of your, your basic wedge. And, you know, they're really known for a lot of bounce and grind issues on, uh, on the club and really just getting good feel and interaction through the turf. Fantastic. Well, what they did move it into the SM8 versus the 7 was, and sorry if you're just listening and not looking. I'm holding up some clubs here to, sh to, to show, but I'll talk about it and hopefully describe it so people can understand it, even if they're just listening audio-wise. What they've done between the 7 and 8 was this. They moved the weighting around. So they added weight up in the top of the hosel part so that they could change where the center of gravity was with the club, all right? So there's more weight up in the hosel. And the hosel kind of is a little bit longer and it's a little bit thicker, but you can't really tell. What's, and then they took some weighting and they added it more toward the toe of the club. And so with the weight high in the hosel and the weight out on the toe, you, what you were doing was you're moving the center of gravity like up and forward. So it's not necessarily the center of gravity isn't, let's say, touching the face of the club. It's actually high and forward of the club. So it's kind of in midair, like the center, the real center of gravity is kind of hovering higher and more forward of the club. That's what they've done. Now, what they did with SM9 is basically the same thing but they wanted to go um farther or further farther with it and make that center of gravity even higher and even more forward so what they did is they they worked some of the internal weighting of the tungsten and stuff inside the the head also they you could see the top line top edge of the wedge is a little thicker so as you get more loft you're going to get a little bit more thickness on the top line of the wedge. So the more lofted the club gets, let's say the lower the ball will go, right? Because they're, they're just moving the center of gravity. So you can get, and I have like a 62 degree wedge and a 60 and I think a 50. I got a bunch of them coming. But what happens is when you go higher loft, ideally you want the ball to go lower. Not lower, like a, like a 62 is not going to go lower than a 60, right? But it's going to go lower than a conventional 62. And it, it, it's going to go lower probably than a conventional 58 for that matter. Like you could really get that ball low. And what you want is lower ball flight, more spin. So you're driving that ball through the wet, uh, air, through the elements. And at a lower angle, you have a lot more distance control. So they've increased the height and the forwardness of their center of gravity. And they've also done some groove stuff. So their grooves are a lot more sharp than normal. So they start off sharp, sharper, they last longer. And ultimately that's kind of what they've done with the new wedges. Now, when it comes to bounce, grind, uh, and all that, kind of stuff that's where it gets confusing obviously they have and this isn't a, you know i'm not giving a titleist like plug here i'm just letting you know what's going on so there's different colors there's the traditional like chrome they've got like a uh, brushed look and then they've got like a dark uh look too so th those aren't important that's just kind of personal preference of what you want when it comes to testing this stuff out that's difficult because there's so many different grinds so many different bounce combinations and shafts 
for that matter. Like you're not going to be able to test everything that that's just not going to happen. So what you want to do is typically you just want to get a little bit heavier shaft than you normally use. But here's my theory with wedge. Obviously the steeper, the swing, the more bounce you would want, right? If you come in steep and you're a digger, get more bounce. If you play on soft conditions, then more bounce is better than firm, tight lies. You want less bounce. But what if you have a steep swing and you play on firm, tight lies? Then what do you do? Well, then you're in trouble, right? So what do you do with this? And then what do you do if your conditions change through the year? Like, okay, I'm in Georgia. In the winter, it's sloppy and wet. All right, cool. In the summer, you have these high fluffy Bermuda lies in the rough, and then you have some tight fairway lies on the bent grass that they, you know, cut tight in the spring. So there's, I mean, I've got all kinds of different lies and all kinds of different conditions based on course to course to course, as well as like sand conditions. Some, some courses have a fluffy soft sand. Other courses have a harder packed, uh, dense sand. So what do you do with that? And here's how I like to put it together. I'll take one club. Let's say I have a 60, a 54, uh, a 50, and then a 46, 48 for my pitching wedge. All right. So I've got four wedges. Here's what I do. I'll take my 60 and I'll put, um, let's say the highest amount of bounce I have in that. So let's say 12 degrees of bounce, right? So now I have a club for like a fluffy uh, sand and a mushy, sloppy condition. And if I'm taking a steeper swing, I've got that club. Then I go to my next one, my 54, let's say, or 56, whatever, you know, your combination is, then I would do a different bounce in that club. So not a 12, I might go to an eight degree. So my bounce changes and I can still use that out of the sand if the sand is firm packed and it just, you know, open up the face. So that's what I would do. And then I'd go down to my 50 and now my 50. Now this doesn't matter so much, but this bounce would probably match closer to what my irons are four, five, six, seven degrees of bounce kind of in there right? Eight degrees. Uh, that's fine too, but I would go less bounce down the line right now. I'm not on tour. I'm not playing week to week. So I don't have somebody to kind of dial in my wedges every week for whatever conditions. Most of us aren't there. So that's what I would do. I would have a high bounce 60 and then lower it as I went. Now, if you like a lot, a very little bounce, in your 60 because of your swing or whatever, then I would do the opposite of that. So let's say you have a very shallow swing and you pick it tight and you clean and you don't like bounce. Then I would go very low bounce, like a four degree bounce in my 60 and have a kind of nothing for all those shots that I want to use no bounce for. But then I would add extra bounce in my next wedge, which would be, let's say my 56. Then I would go up. So I had something with some bounce. All right, then you can always play with it because uh, as you open up the face, you're going to add bounce. So if you if you had low bounce in your 60, like four degrees, but you needed more in the sand, then you just open that up a ton and it adds from four to up to 12 degrees of bounce. But if you need more distance out of that particular sand shot, then you go to your next club and you do the same and you add bounce by opening up that face. Also, just to kind of make it simple for everybody, when you do this, okay, when you get your wedges, what you want to do is instead of buying all the wedges to, you know, that go with your swing, like I said, like space it out. So you have a little bit of everything. And then you're just going to have to adjust your approach to that shot for the wedge you have, meaning you're going to have to practice a bit so that you're comfortable and familiar with what you have to work with. And then if you have a 
uh, tight lie and a lot of bounce on your wedge, you're going to have to play a different shot, right? If you have a 16 degrees of bounce on your 60 degree wedge and you have a tight lie, you, you're, that's going to be very, very difficult. And so people think they're a horrible wedge player. No, you have a good wedge. You're just not using it in the right situation. So you would have to then do a totally different shot. Chip with your seven iron, chip it with your hybrid, putt it, something different. Don't use a high bounced club off a super tight lie. That's just not going to work. So you just got to know that. So hopefully that simplifies kind of what's going on in wedges more so you have some kind of insight as to hey this is exactly what's happening right now because ultimately you right you're going to want to upgrade your wedges more often than you probably do like you don't want to keep a wedge around for like four or five years you're going to wear out your grooves like they don't last that long like your 60 degree wedge i mean I practice with that. I'll hit a hundred balls out of a bunker for practice one day. I'll do a whole bucket. So a week of that, I mean, those aren't sharp wedges, but it, the, you know, but I can control the spin for a, a long time because you know, of how you strike it in the fairway. So that's what I would say. Like, you know, look at like what you're doing, make sure you're practicing and just work on contact because that's going to be the, your best friend. And then if you have a wedge that doesn't apply for the shot, use the tool that does. And that, you know, watch watch my videos because we go over a lot of that. And then we, we can get you dialed in for the shot that you have. Not the club you have. Like use the club for the shot. All right. So. Maybe I made that more confusing than it really is, but that's ultimately what's going on with the new wedges. They're trying to get it go lower with more control. And I like that. And there's all kinds of options. You could figure out like what kind of grind do you want? You know what, to be honest with you, like the average player isn't really going to be able to tell this grind versus that grind. It's just not. So you can make it work if, if for what you got, uh, have to work with. So don't worry so much about the grind, focus on loft and balance and make sure the loft gapping is typically four degrees. So 60, 56, 52, 48, right? Or 46, 50, 54, 58. That's kind of where you want to be. 62, 64, like, so four degrees is kind of roughly where you want your your gapping in your lofts to be. And then just work that bounce so that you got a little bit of everything to work with and you'll should be good. All right. All right. Everybody's asked me a couple things. One, um, well, like of the private clubs I've reviewed, right? <laughs> like what's my best one? Where, where do they rank? And I have reviewed a number of them and those are fun videos i'm glad you guys like those i have a lot of fun with those and more coming so some people li like pieces of them they don't like other pieces some people love those pieces you know what i'm talking about some people don't so whatever uh love it or hate it we're having a good time doing it and i'm trying to get you know a good cross section of different types of of clubs out there like we did the bridges down in san diego phil mickelson's where he where he's a member uh, we did the Grand Del Mar, and a lot of pros were members there. We did the uh, Bernardo Heights, where uh, Xander Shoffley and a lot of other up-and-coming, you know, players ha grew up playing. So, we're the top. Well, the first one I did was East Lake, and uh, I was asked to take that down, forced <coughs> to take that down. Anyways, that's okay. That that course is great. Okay, so. There's two things. There's indoor clubhouse facilities versus course, the golf course. Like, what's the best golf course? And now East Lake is home of the Tour Championship. It's a big boy go golf course, but it's not like the greatest golf course I've ever played. TPC Sawgrass 
probably would be the number one golf course that I've played. And that video is coming out soon. Now, TBC Saugers also probably has the best clubhouse. They have the most iconic clubhouse probably in the game of golf. Phenomenal. I did not go into the member area there. I could have, I could have went in, but to film in there, if I went in, I would have filmed. And I, so I just chose not to go in because I probably would have gotten in trouble for filming in there. And they did ask you not to go in there. So I respected that and didn't go in. But that clubhouse, number one, by far, I would say TPC Sawgrass would be the, the top tier for everything. Course, courses was number one. And clubhouse, iconic, was up there. Like amenities wise, for like a member, it, I would go like the bridges would be number one. I mean, that was like, they had everything. They, I mean, the, the indoor, the, the, the jacuzzis, the showers, phenomenal place, all the food and stuff they have. I mean, that, that place is pretty awesome. So as a member, I would say the, so far, the bridges would be, you know, top tier in my book. And that's in San Diego. Right up there would be the Grand Del Mar. The only reason they're not up there with the bridges is because one, I think practice wise and facility and course, the bridges is better than the Grand Del Mar. Now the Grand Del Mar has a pretty awesome like saltwater jacuzzi and awesome inside member area. However, they do allow um, re, uh, hotel guests to play golf there. So I think for that, like, you're going to have a lot of like visitors and resort people on the course. It's expensive, but versus the bridges, you're just going to have guests of members there. You're not going to just like people, you know, people aren't going to stay anywhere and just show up and play the bridges versus the Grand Del Mar. That's what would happen. But I did, I did really like the Grand Del Mar. It's a beautiful place. I love it. And I just think for a member's experience, Bridges is going to be a little bit better than the uh, Grand Del Mar. Bernardo Heights was phenomenal. I mean, that's just a great, like, you're going to get good. You're going to practice. You're going to have a lot of great players to play with. But just kind of standard, middle of the road um, country club. It's fine. It's great. The Probably the best membership thing was the four-course membership in North Georgia called the Champions Membership, where you're a member of um, White Columns, the Polo Club, the Manor, and Atlanta National Golf Club. Now, Atlanta National is the best golf course. That's a real deal golf course. They have big time tournaments there and qualifiers, so, and college events. So that's a real kind of Pete Dye, tough, tough, could be really tough track. And now that's so those that four course membership, it's cool because you're not it's not like you get to play at the four courses. You're actually a member at all four, a full member, which means four club championships for everything. And that is probably the best bang for the buck. Prices fluctuate. So, you know, I can't always say like, oh, it's this much. It varies all the time. So that was something that was. That was really good. And then um, Sherwood, obviously you've heard of Sherwood. Like that's, you know, Los Angeles area, Los Angeles, Ventura County out there. Big names are there. Greatest hockey player ever is a member there. And a lot of actors and celebrities and you name it. That's pretty awesome, awesome place. You can't really walk it, but you're not walking the bridges or the Grand Del Mar either. You, you, you're going to walk some like East Lake and. TBC Sawgrass, you'll walk those, but yeah, I would say Sherwood's phenomenal golf course, world class. They have obviously they used to have Tigers event there, they have Champions Tour event there, and beautiful, beautiful place. I mean, you're just you're paying a couple. I mean, arm and a leg, two legs, two arm. You're you're paying everything to be there, and it's uh, you know that you, you get what you pay for. You get that exclusivity. So I would put that up there. Clubhouse is phenomenal. Course is phenomenal. And it's impeccable condition like year round. So the, the ones I've done are, yeah, 
Okay, the TPC Sawgrass would be number one in my book. I've played other ones that I haven't videoed, like Cypress Point, one of the most exclusive, hardest clubs to you know get on in the world, and that's by far my all-time favorite. The parking lot is like a gravel parking lot. It's just there's not very many spots so very few people are playing there day in day out it's right on the ocean monterey you, you've seen some of the most iconic holes in the world Pho uh, photograph there it's incredible there's the clubhouse and amenities are there's you, you know they wouldn't be like amazing in any sense of the word they're just it's just that old school classic hey i'm sh i'm just here to play golf and the course, when I played it, the guy says to me, oh, well, they punched the greens like a couple weeks ago. Sorry about that. Best greens I've ever put it on, like in my life. You couldn't see one punch mark. And yet he was like, yeah, they're not as good as they normally are. And, the, and I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And the course was like crowded that day, I think, because there were like two groups of people on it. He's like, yeah, it's not normally like this. <laughs> So not much play goes on there and course was spectacular. And I mean, every hole is unique and memorable. So, I mean, that would be number one, but of the ones you've seen on my channel, Sawgrass, which hasn't come out yet, it's coming out soon. It, uh, it's number one. All right, let's wrap it up with this. There's been a lot of talk and I've talked about it before on this channel, I was like, who is the best golf YouTuber? Now, look, like Rick Shields was doing a, something on his where he talked about this and a lot of people kind of commented, like I was never mentioned, which is fine, I don't really care, but a lot of people commented and you know let me know about it. And then I think somebody else did one too where they were ranking and again, I mean, I was left out, out. I wasn't so what like I don't care that's fine and here's the deal like I do know this is like there's some good ones like people are mentioning Bryson oh he look Bryson's not a YouTuber he does a YouTube channel but he's a tour player so of course he would be number one but we don't count that guy because he's just a tour guy doing a YouTube channel and so I, I wouldn't put him in there who is the best? It and I'll tell you, it's it's kind of tough to say. I know this as a golfer who competes a lot. That uh, hey, golf is is a cruel sport. You could practice eight hours a day and then go shoot an eighty in competition. Like that's happened to people all the time. So it's just a cruel sport. It does, you don't necessarily get out what you put in when you want it. Like it'll come and go and. So anybody could kind of beat anybody, I would say, on on any given day. Well, maybe not anybody in the YouTube world, but you see it on the on the PGA Tour, right? Like, these guys all work their tail off, and then all of a sudden, like, how did he win? Where did he come from? Like, where's this? I've never heard of this guy. And then there he is, right? So all this kind of stuff happens over and over and over and over. Well, it, the same thing would happen in YouTube land. Now, just because you have a big channel or you look good on camera doesn't mean you're that good. It, it, there's a lot of stuff going on. Like you could be good. I know like the good, good crew, like they do a lot of these challenges where they're doing alternate shot or best ball or all. So there's a lot of things that look really good, but you know, when it comes to playing your own ball in a match, I, I mean, I don't know. That's, that remains to be seen. We haven't had a real competition amongst us. I would say that I would be happy to put my game out there in any type of an, of not any type, but in an event where we were competing against each other. I think that would be really cool. And here's my kind of thing with that. And it's something I've thought about for years now. I think there should be something with all, a bunch of us who want to be in. And I, the, the, this is what I've come up with, like in my brain that I think would be good here. And here's why, like we all love watching 
golf when Tiger from 2000 and till whenever when Tiger was just dominating. Like that was great. Why did we love it? It's because every Sunday we knew if Tiger was in, I get to see Tiger Woods play on Sunday. It was like watching your football team. Okay, if you're a Ram fan, you get to watch the Rams every Sunday play a game. And they made it and win the Super Bowl, right? So that's how people become fans of the game of football because they have a team that they root for and their team goes against other teams. All right, so that's great. Golf with Tiger was very similar. So we all either loved or hated Tiger, but every week he was in the mix, either against Phil, maybe against Ernie, against BJ Singh, and against other people that would come in uh, from time to time. And so, and there was a lot of other people that beat him here and there or were there that were like, like Rocco Mediate, like, okay, we love Rocco Mediate, but he wasn't in the mix hardly at all much, not a lot, right? And so when he was playing Tiger in 08 in the US Open at Torrey Pines, it didn't matter. It was Tiger was there. And so it didn't matter who was going against him. That tournament was gonna get a big draw because we were all rooting for him. So with YouTube, that's the thing, like we're all creating content. So you either like, people like me, they hate me, it doesn't matter, right? You like Rick Shields, you like um, golf sidekick, you like the GMs and the good goods or whoever, right? You have your people that you watch and you get consistent content from them. Maybe it's Zach Rafford, Andrew Jensen, these players who can play. So you like their content. Well, that's what golf is missing like the tour level, they're missing that because we all produce consistent content. Now, the tour produces consistent content, but our favorite player isn't there all the time. Like Ricky Fowler isn't around on the weekend right now. Or where's Bryson? He's hurt, so I don't get the, Brooks is there, okay, and then he's not there. And then, well, what if I like somebody else? but I don't get to see them because they're not in the mix. So I, I, then I never see them and I lose interest. And so I don't get to root for my favorite player like I used to. I love Phil, but is Phil playing every week? No, I think that's what the Saudi tour can bring, but that's what YouTubers can bring. We can create some type of like tour where we all compete against one another, where you, the viewers, get to see all of us that they like. So you would see me, let's say, all the time, every week in a match against another YouTuber. So if you were a fan of me, you would watch me. Maybe you're a fan of everybody, you would watch everybody, but you would get consistent people playing against each other, which I think would be awesome. I would do it like this, I would create leagues and um, like, like the NFL, I would, I would structure it very similar to the NFL, where you have um, <clears throat> the East and the West, right? Maybe the US and the UK. And then you have different divisions in there where, okay, in this division, there's four players. Let's say where, where I live, there, it'd be me, um, let's say Zach Rafford's nearby, Andrew Jensen's nearby, and then maybe whoever else, right? And there's four of us and we each play each other twice, right? Once at a course where I pick, once at a course where they pick, and we play, let's say, a nine hole match play match. No strokes, straight up. I play you and my, you know, track, and then we play your track, and nine holes go on my channel, nine holes go on your channel. We kind of schedule our own thing, and we, we play each other, and then we play everybody in our division. We could play some we have a schedule, we play some people outside of our division, very similar to what the NFL does, right? And then based on our, let's say, divisional performance, we make the playoffs, right? And then we compete against one another in, a play, in the playoffs, same thing, one, like home and away matches, they call it. We play one at yours, nine at yours, nine at mine. Now, obviously, there'd be some scheduling, it'd be challenging, but let's say in the playoffs, it would just be a neutral site, nine holes, winner take all, and move on, right? Move on, and then that's how we could do it. 
and then ultimately there would be it would be cool. It'd be like the NFC and the AFC, uh, US versus UK. Two guys go head to head. Maybe everybody could come out, and we can have other matches throughout. But that would be kind of the 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 rough structure of what I would do in terms of formulating this type of uh, of you know, um, videos for people, because I think it would be something that people would really, really love to see. So that would be, I think in my book, that would be, that's, that's my idea of how to kind of go about figuring this out. So it's not about like, okay, let's guess who's the best. Let's just do it and put something together so we can play. I don't think we all need to come to one location and have a tournament because that's just, there's no content we can create there. What my idea would be, we create consistent content and then this content airs on a specific day each week. So people know like, hey, I get to watch these matches every week. And then you watch the matches you wanna watch, you watch them all, you figure out, you keep, you know, track of the standings. We have a website where we're all, you know, the matches are going on and it's just a lot of drama, some trash talking back and forth. Like it's our own league, right? I don't want one video, one tournament. I want personally a league where we all come together and we're part of, and that way we, we have like a stake in it and it goes on. It's ongoing you know, content, like a series of videos and seasons over and over and over. And then, you know, you're winning a championship. You're doing this and it's not something like, oh, we're all pro golfers. We're going to grind to be the best, you know, whatever. It's more like, hey, we have fun. We're, we're creating content within content. And then I think keep it fun, lighthearted like that. And we all kind of have a good time and egg each other on, root for one another and create cool content. That would be, in my opinion, the best way to go so that we're we're giving everybody something they want to see. These head-to-head matches with all of us, let's say YouTubers who like to play and compete and m- more than that, have fun in the game of golf and mic'd up, there's, you know, personality, you get to know us a little better on course, what we're thinking, all that kind of stuff that we want to hear from the PGA Tour, but they're playing for millions and millions of dollars we're playing for, you know, millions of views, which we like. And so we can enjoy that and not take it so crazy serious. All right. So let me know what you think about all of that. And let's, uh, let's keep cranking out these, uh, these podcasts and talk about the issues surrounding this game and ways we can get better, things we can improve on and what's going on in this world. Love you guys. Take care. See you next time.